Uncle Lyndon Davis, if he would perform a welcome to country for us. Yo, yo, way. Wanya. Nara. Wanya ngalam. Wanya ngalam malula cakan. Kali ni nanami. Cucu mau pirono, kayan man murang eh, cakun kun ganjon ku, bini nanaju, banyak banyak jimi, cakan barang tu cundu, cundu cundu kuci. Yo wey, wanya yang yang, wanya yang yang gan, kalanggonin. Yo wey, Nara, hello, hello, yo wanya Nara, yo. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Lyndon Davis. Uh, I'm a descendant of traditional custodians. Um, you know, they said Uncle Lyndon. I said, yeah, them young ones call me that, but there's a lot of uncles and aunties already out there, you know, older than me, you know, but, you know, I'm just saying I'd just like to acknowledge that, that uh, uh, our elders in the room here, especially Auntie Hope, back there, uh, Cub Cub Elder, and uh, Acknowledge your family here also. Uh, you know, all the elders and other country men and women, especially uh, our guests here, um, very warm welcome on behalf of our mom. Uh, Wanya is the word for welcome in this country, Kapi Kapi landscape. And this area here, we're talking about Malula Jagan, which is referring to Malula homelands, Jagan is home, ground, earth, and Malula is referring to the Red Valley Black Snake. So um, that's who I sort of speak on behalf and represent. Great great grandmother from the district. In the 1850s, she was born in the Mulula River, and so I was using her language, and I used it a lot in the songs and dances. And that pretty much the language was quoting from an old song talking about walking here, walking, living on this landscape. And you know the people that lived here before us. You know, my ancestors, I think about it every day, every time I look at the trees, the plants, the animals, the landscape, the oceans, everything. I know that uh, their presence there, because uh, they did the job of caring for it for us, the next generation. And I'm doing my best to learn from the land and, uh, and you know, continue in the custodianship that was uh, shown before. And so, you know, the more we know about the place, uh, the better it can be cared for. You know, they follow that. They don't know nothing about that car. They don't know how to look after that car, you know. It's the same thing. You don't know much about this landscape. Uh, you don't really, you're oblivious to a lot of the things that are actually going on that, that'll help, uh, you know, and benefit you in, in many ways, especially healthy mind, healthy spirit style. But uh, as I said, I was born in the district. I was born in Nambour and raised by my grandmother. My mum, she's still alive, she lives up at Maraburra, at Oakhurst. You never heard that one, eh? Oakhurst, where's Maraburra, Oakhurst? <laughs> uh, yeah, but there is, it's a new estate, Wuku, uh, West Maraburra. But she lives out there, uh, Donna Johnson. Uh, but, uh, and Dad, he's from Sherbrooke, and he lives, he still lives out of Sherbrooke there. And, uh, and so, you know, but raised by my grandmother, here in Nambour from when I was about two months old. And also my pop, Seski Kwandi. So always pay respects to my elders because they're, they're the reason why you know I made it this far. They were such good role models <coughs> for me. And uh, I try to be the next role models for the next generation. And so, you know, for the last probably 25, going on 27 years, I think 27, another fellow said 30, go on then 30 then. Uh, <laughs> but I will be going for 30, probably 40, I don't know, I'm going as long as I can. Uh, doing the best I can uh, on this landscape, represent my family and speaking on behalf of them. Uh, a lot of them are elders that I grew up with, you know, that are older than me and my older cousins. They'd be there going, oh, you, you, you get up there, boy, you get up there and say something. We can't say it like you. You play that ditch too, so you get up there, you know, you make it well for us. You make us look good. No, yeah, but, but, you know, uh, I always try to, you know, make all, the mob, all of us uh, empower, you know, like I was empowered by a lot of Aboriginal people uh, in my lifetime and still are. And so, you know, I just try and, and, and play my role as well. So it was, uh, as part of the welcome, um, I always play this musical instrument. 
Uh, but before I do, I'd also like to acknowledge that one of our elders, Cup Cup Elder, uh, has just uh, left us and passed away uh, in the last uh, week or so. And so, you know, two weeks or so. And so, you just pay condolences to the families there and, um, you know, pay respects. Also, before I play the ditch, most importantly, uh, the ditch master has also passed away. And uh, a lot of people don't really sort of, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm black. that's where this comes from up there, North East Arnhem Land, uh, Western, North Queensland districts, Western Yellowgy. Northern parts is where this instrument comes from. Not so much down here, southeast Queensland, not the same sort of landscape where you would find the didgeridoo. Uh, but it did get down this way, and a lot of people play it now all around the world. But we just must pay respects to the originators, the original people that looked after this one for the rest of the world to see. And the ditch master has uh, just, a, he's a bit of a legend. You know, you know your didgeridoos. I'm not even going to say the name of the didgeridoo at the moment, just for protocol, because you're not even allowed to say the name, his name, uh, for protocol as well. Uh, I've heard in Northeast Arnhem Land, the families will say, you may not speak his name, and for at least five to ten years, some ten years, I've heard. And so, uh, and so I just want to, you know, keep that uh, going, that law, and pass that knowledge on. But uh, I'm just going to play it good. <laughs> I don't know how to play it proper. <laughs> There's proper ditch players out there. Like I said, the ditch masters and all his family. That's them. You're looking at this, you're looking at them. Uh, so I'll play it to the, my best of ability, you know, paying my respects to those families there, and I'll play some good didgeridoo. That's what an old Arnhem Land fella said to me. Uncle Gurman, he come from the Me Watch Dancers, and they came down to Wood Woodford Dance Folk Festival. We had to perform before them. I was very intimidated. My cousin said, play that ditch good, you'll pay respects to them people. I said, Okay. <laughs> and after I played it, they wanted my ditch and they played it in their dance. And then after the dance, later on that night, when we were sitting around the, the campsite, the Murray camp there, uh, Uncle Gorman there, around the fire, said, Linda, you play good did you do, boy, but you need to come up home and we'll teach you how to play proper. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they sort of wait that chance now and they get up there and I'll be playing it around the place. Might do a bit of busking and get myself out there. And, no, again, but no, a uh, lot of respect for this musical instrument. I'd like to use it as part of the welcome to country, welcome all the good people, welcome all the good spirits. You know, also I pay respects to our Torres Strait Island families, also our South Sea Island families as well. And Yinnaburra Nation, sorry Yinnaburra, no, <laughs> but Yinnaburra, them fellas up in the mountains there. Uh, yeah, they're part of the Cuppy Cuppy clan as well, so, go away. <laughs>
Uh, you would, many of you would already be members of Scritchy, the Sunshine Coast Reconciliation Group, but if you aren't, uh, there are membership forms. You might have been given one as you came in the door. We're a very small voluntary group and our main aims are obviously to um, advance reconciliation on the Sunshine Coast and we do that by staging several events through the year. This is the first of our shared history seminars for this year uh, with Dr Jackie Huggins. Um, we have held many, many shared history seminars, uh, mostly organised by Meredith Walker, who's here with us today, and then we will have a couple more towards the end of this year, uh, where we invite both local people and sometimes academics or historians um, to speak about events on the Sunshine Coast. You'll also notice at the front that we have our booklet about the frontier wars on the Sunshine Coast for sale. That was prepared for us by Ray Kirchhoff after he did some research on uh, frontier skirmishes uh, in this area. I'd like to thank Councillor Christian Dixon, particularly today. Unfortunately, at the last minute, he wasn't able to come, uh, but he was responsible for uh, providing some funding for us to stage this event. Scridgy has no income except donations and council grants, so we're extremely grateful to the Sunshine Coast Council for their ongoing support of us. I'd also like to thank uh, members of the Sunshine Coast University staff and students for attending, uh, Professor Tim West and uh, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic and Linda West, and Professor Ross Young, Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research and Innovation, and Maria Lawson for attending today. And all of you, thank you for coming. Our format today, uh, Dr. Jackie Huggins will speak and then I uh, will take some questions, uh, which I'm hoping uh, Stephen will um, uh, wrangle. And uh, if you could wait, if you have a question, if you could wait for the mic to come to you. Um, we will then have uh, book signings outside. Uh, Jackie is um, signing books for you. And uh, Denise Proud is selling her beautiful jewellery um, plus, you'll be able to buy Scriggy raffle tickets uh, for our, our first prize here, which is um, Aunty Bridget Chili's um, painting of uh, skies around Nambour. Um, and this is the raffle prize is going to be drawn next Tuesday at the um, Auntie Betty Memorial Walk, which you would have got a flyer for. Um, that's being held in uh, Point Park in Malula, Malula Bar, uh, right at the end of the Malula River, the mouth of the Malula River, next Tuesday, if you're interested in coming along to that. Um, that's a free event, and um, Annie Bridget Chili will be leading a walk there. Uh, toilets, women's toilets are downstairs out this side, and the men's downstairs out that side. There's an emergency door here. If you hear any booming noises or something alarms you dreadfully, just run out that door. Um, there's a, um, what do you call it? Assembly area. Assembly area over there with the kangaroos over there. Um, I would advise people if you cannot socially distance, the government advice is still that you should wear a mask. Um, so um, leave that to your discretion, uh, but I would advise that that's a good idea. Parking is free today, um, and I'll hand over now to Stephen Mann, who is the First Nations Partnership Officer, one of two, for the Sunshine Coast Council, and he will chair today. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you to Lyndon for that warm welcome. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Kabi Kabi peoples, and Kabi Kabi country where we're meeting today. And a special um, pay my respects to Annie Hope, um, 
and there's uh, a lot of elders in the room today, actually. Um, Uncle Kevin, Auntie Judy Winks, um, Auntie Denise Pratt, um, Auntie Jackie, of course, who I'm about to introduce. I'd like to also acknowledge some of our allies in the room, uh, Charmaine Foley and Paul Richards. It's a long history of supporting the community. And I know many others in the room today that I haven't seen in a while have also been great supporters in their own right, working in different areas in the community. So thank you to you all. I'd like to pay my respects also to Unibarra people in the hinterland. And I'd like to acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. And in doing so, we recognize that everything our ancestors achieved before us benefits us today, as what we achieve today benefits future generations. My name is Stephen Mann. I'm a Torres Strait Islander from Brisbane. I'm the Senior Advisor for First Nations Partnerships with Council. And I'd like to also say hello to Councillor David Law, who's in the room today. Thank you for coming along. I think in the spirit of reconciliation, can I ask a quick exercise that you lean over to someone you don't know and just tell them your first name and where you were born so we get to know each other. I'll give you 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, Brisbane. My father is a Dr. Jackie Huggins is a Bidjara Biragaba Juru woman from central Queensland and north Queensland. She is a highly accomplished writer, historian and social justice activist. Jackie Huggins' phenomenal body of work has seen her make dynamic and highly significant contributions to the wider Australian community for more than four decades. I remember seeing that yellow coat in Canberra from Reconciliation. <laughs> Having worked extensively across academic, gov academic, government and community spheres, Dr Huggins has published widely on Australian Indigenous issues and in particular on history and women's studies. She has served on many committees, advisory boards, inquiries and commissions notably in the areas of reconciliation, Indigenous education and employment, domestic and family violence, the prison and correction system, constitutional reform, and philanthropy. <clears throat> Dr. Huggins' most recent appointment has been to the Co-Chair Treaty Advancement Committee, which will lead all Queenslanders on to the next stage of establishing a treaty process. Aunty Jackie has devoted her life to ensuring a just and equitable outcome for her people and to reconcile a just and fair Australia in which we all enjoy the benefits. Would you please welcome Aunty Jackie, Dr. Hagen. Senior. 
who I guess um, in a very real way was one of my political mentors back in the day. So uh, great to see you and carries, carrying on his legacy as well. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Lyndon Davis and the great work he does in terms of uh, the Sunshine Coast and the Gubby Gubby people. I want to acknowledge also my sister Hope Chin, uh, who is with us today as well. Sister girl, good to see you. And to uh, all our, um, our elders in the room, our uh, First Nations peoples, brothers and sisters, I want to acknowledge you. But also, also I want to acknowledge uh, the good allies and supporters that we have here too, of which uh, there are many, many of you, and who share this struggle as, uh, as much as we do. I want to acknowledge also my sister girl, Denise Proud um, Chambers from Sherberg, where uh, our people were sent um, and uh, incarcerated there for, for a long, long time. So. Um, and Denise has travelled up from Brisbane with me and uh, has some wonderful, her wonderful jewellery, which I always wear, uh, makes me uh, very proud of uh, our culture and, and our people. And to all of you, Judy, I see you here too. Um, and I'm sorry if I've um, missed any uh, of the other elders here, but to also to the Miglu elders, uh, good to see you. Um, I want to thank uh, the um, uh, Sunshine Coast Reconciliation Group. I can't say the acronym, it's too, you know, uh, it's not within my grasp to do that. Sunshine Coast, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the council as well. To my friends here, both uh, old and new, uh, great to see you all again. And I do love coming to the Sunshine Coast. I often think. Maybe one day I'll retire here, but um, <laughs> would love to love to do that. But uh, I've got so many friends here, which is great. And we've had events uh, before, of which um, were organised by a good friend and co-journey journeyer in the reconciliation process, Charmaine Foley, and to her husband too, Tony. I know that uh, you've followed me on this journey for a long time, as have. Uh, Doy Holmes up there, <laughs> and I could go on. Um, but great to see you all again, and happy National Reconciliation Week Yay. to all of you. And what a week it's been. <laughs> the pendulum, my friends, um, it is swinging. I would hope that I would live to see the day when it did, because for 30 years, uh, my watch has been under very conservative governments. Uh, certainly my time spent in reconciliation has been through that, apart from a few little mutterings when we had Labor government in there now. But um, we've got a great opportunity now, I believe, to, to really strike while the iron's hot. Let's not leave it anymore. Our people have been patient for so, so long. And now we have the opportunity to actually do action. Well, the government needs to do that action. But most of all, we need you with us. We can't do it alone. We are 3% of the population. And something very big in our history is coming up. And we know that to be the referendum. And I know that all of you will answer the call because you are the converted. Uh, if you are not, you will be by the end of today. <laughs> and so, so there's an impending referendum for a voice to Parliament that uh, has shaken up this nation. But please let us not get too excited for this. It's wonderful that it's here. But there is a question to be, um, to be made before we can look at a successful referendum. And we hope that um, that question will not be like the last question where, um, where the referendum was lost. 
Out of um, 44 referenda held in this country, only eight have passed. The most resounding one for us was in 1967, of course, where our people were no longer put into the Flora and Fauna Act of our country. The sheep, the goat, the cattle were counted more than us as human beings. We were not counted. That changed and since then there's been a proliferation of uh, highs and lows which we all know about in our history that has moved us forward in, in some occasions but held us back in most and I do believe it's been the last 30 years or so where that has been stalled. Now we're coming through the other side. Yes, it's true we have a new government. We are, we're, well, personally I am very, very uh, glad to be rid of a very hostile government, an unfriendly government against our people and felt like felt like they would have to give up something. They would have to give up something in order for us to obtain our rights. This is changing. It has to change. Because remember like Marvo, did we take your backyards? Did we steal your, your furniture and cars and what else? No, that never happened. The same with the referendum and the same with voice, treaty and truth, of which I'll come to very shortly. So it's been for my journey um, about 30 years now, officially involved in the reconciliation process. I've been on the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation, uh, Reconciliation Australia, and re um, also the patron for the Reconciliation uh, Queensland Incorporated, with my very good friend, Dame Quentin Bryce. And uh, the other day we had a, a great um, breakfast at Parliament House, as we always do, and we thoroughly uh, enjoyed um, uh, each other's company, but you know, telling each other uh, stories and networking as well. Could have been a bit more than that, but, um, but still, you know, that's the way we do it during National Reconciliation Week. So for me, um, reconciliation has never ever been a soft issue for me. It's always been something hard that we must strive for. And people back then actually didn't even get it, you know. People did not get the concept of reconciliation. They said, let's change the name because, you know, we've never had a marriage between us and come back to reconcile, but look, by then, by the time the second council for Aboriginal reconciliation was established, and I was in it, it became a, um, a household name. And very much now, everyone knows what reconciliation is. It may be differently defined by everybody, but for me, it's about three things, really. It's about recognition, justice, and healing. Once we have those three things, I think we can actually move forward in terms of uh, a true and equitable society. It's been a very long journey for us, for us all who've been uh, involved in that, um, that process. And I, I would say to all of us, we've been involved in the process ever since we were born. Every one of us has a stake and a role to play within reconciliation because we live here, we are Australians, of course this is Aboriginal land, always was, always will be, and will continue to be. But people need to recognise, understand it, learn their history, and walk together with us. We've also seen right now the highs and lows, as I say, I'll take you through, through a few of them, We've seen the magnificent increase in our First Nations politicians across the board um, in the last election. And of course, the, uh, the wonderful and uh, honourable Linda Burney as our first Minister for Indigenous Affairs 
I mean, how good is that? How good is that? Linda will lead us, I know, through the referendum, through all the social uh, ills that we face in our country. Uh, she will be a, a very worthy uh, minister. And we're very, very proud of her as a, as a, as a titter and a sister who will um, lead us through that. She also was on the um, second council of uh, Aboriginal reconciliation with me all those years ago. We're quite young women, we're in our 30s, and uh, it was, um, it's been wonderful to see her journey and her walk through this as well. But we all can, we can all do this together. Now, I've been attending lately um, a lot of writers' festivals. I've had two books out in this year, in February and uh, April. And one of the highs of that, I've seen the, the, the engaged minds of people and the people attending these, um, these events. And once upon a time, there would just be six people in the room when you did a writer's conference. And you could count the number of authors on this hand. Now we see, we see hundreds and hundreds of our authors coming to the fore. We see them winning major prizes. Melissa Lukashenko, the Miles Franklin Award a couple of years ago. Just this year, we've seen Tony Birch win the uh, New South Wales Fiction Prize, overall fiction prize. And we've seen Anita Heiss win the um, Indigenous uh, Prize for New South Wales. So it's, uh, it's a fantastic turn of the landscape and what we've seen now is a whole renaissance of Aboriginal art and culture uh, that is taking place in the, in the last couple of years. When I published my book, Sister Girl, in 1998, when I had black hair, and I know that some of you've got copies, so they're relics, keep them together, <laughs> to my Sister Girl now, 1998, I had sold uh, more books in two months than I ever did in 24 years for the first Sister Girl. Now, what is that saying to us? Well, what, what it says to me is that um, people could not receive it back then. People could not receive those messages. UQP were very brave to publish it. And then um, after that, more books came up. But people just didn't want to know about us. Now we're being celebrated and uh, you know, applauded for uh, the work that we've done. My Sister Girl book, it's, about, it's got about a third of new material in it. Uh, it is really um, something that uh, actually I wrote, I wrote a lot of those uh, as university essays in the 80s, many of those. And I love telling the story of, you know, being the pupil you hated to, you, you would most like to hate. And that was me because I would finish assignments three weeks ahead of everybody else. I would want more. I found the act of uh, uh, loving to write at university. And one of my tutors, rest in peace, Christine McElvaney, said to me way back then, uh, you're a writer, you should write. Um, so that gave me the confidence, of course, um, like most Aboriginal people uh, in the room, I'm sure, who have stories of you know, being turned away and uh, low expectations of our people uh, as we went through school. And for me, it was no different. At Nala State High School, I went to the headmistress and said I wanted to do senior. She looked at me and she said, oh, you're Aboriginal, aren't you? And I said, yes. And she said, oh, well, yeah, no. You, you, you can't do senior, you wouldn't be, you couldn't possibly do senior. So what that does to a child at that age puts a psychological stumbling block in your head. You think you're dumb, you can't succeed, and, uh, well, the rest is history and look where I am now. 
That is not a, a one-off story. We all have it. Every Aboriginal person in this room would have stories like those. So what I am proud to see is the number of uh, Indigenous students going through university now as well. They are able to be succeeding right across the board in terms of um, law, medicine, um, astrophysicists as well. Um, we have, of course, our second, no, our first, uh, my, my nephew Nathan Jaro is our first Queensland Indigenous judge. Um, he's been there for about three years. And now we have Lincoln Crowley, who is in the uh, Supreme Court, Paul, isn't it? Yeah, our first. And um, they, uh, it's just fabulous to see this whole tide, um, it's just turning, uh, I believe. But still a long way to go, and we shouldn't really rest on our laurels because, of course, we'll be facing a no campaign. If the referendum uh, is on the table, we need the question, but we will have all the kinds of racists and bigots and you know who come out and uh, attack us. It will be ugly. It will be ugly. Just like marriage equality, there will be um, uh, some extremists that will want to uh, put us down. Well, I think with the support of all of you, uh, your families, your friends, I think it's a different, uh, a different experience than it would have been had we tried this even 10 years ago in terms of getting a referendum out. So we need all of you, and my plea is to all of you to uh, make sure that you, know, you get and you vote with us and we do want to see a voiced parliament because that is the agenda that um, the... Uh, the current government will be pushing. So, I think that, um, you know, people often talk about reconciliation as being one of those really wishy-washy, kind of soft issues. Let me tell you, it is not. It is not. It's hard work and it makes perseverance really, really matter. And for anybody, if you fall off the wagon, so to speak, you will come back because the reconciliation is really and deeply in your blood by this stage. Like all of us, all of us um, here today, I'm sure, you know, many of us share different bloodlines and different, um, uh, different, um, people in our families, but, you know, I, I've never known, because of the history of our country, where my white blood comes from. We know that there's been cattle station owners in central Queensland, uh, but they haven't come to claim us yet. But you know what? I don't know where my white blood comes from. It's probably a reconciliation exercise for me to find out before, before you know what. But I know a lot of you have heard this joke before. Don't know where my white blood comes from, but I do pray it's Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, no, Huggins is a, when I went to London, oh, that's, a, that's an English name, you know. But um, maybe that's further down the track for me because I've got too much to do in terms of um, saving the world in other places and not, you know, responding to my uh, white family history. So reconciliation is hard work, and I just want to acknowledge the Sunshine Coast um, uh, Reconciliation Group as well as Noongar. We've got Beth Hickey here who ran that for many years with Nani Ruth Hegarty and. Um, and Laura and the others on the north side of Brisbane. Now, these are the groups that have always sort of stuck together. They have never given up and they have, uh, in fact, really kept it together. You know, the true believers, I call us, the true believers. 
but hopefully more will join. More, more will join the the um, the gathering now that we've got such a, a golden opportunity to spread the word amongst uh, white fellows and uh, and migrants and other um, other ethnic groups as well. And um, I know that Denise is on the um, Reconciliation Queensland Committee and it's, it's really uh, good to see people, if you want to join, you should join up, you know, it's free, it's kind of, you can follow, you can follow us here in this great movement. And we always wanted to create this people's movement back in the day. And that people's movement, I believe, it's gone underground a bit, but it's coming up again, it's resurfacing. After lying dormant, not, not, not so much dormant, but being underground for the last 30 years. And really that's been because it's been on such a conservative government watch. So here we are now in terms of being able to reignite that and to, um, to get the, the horrible statistics that our people still face through the close the gap measures. Only three targets are on track out of 17 targets to close that gap. You know, when we first started this, they said that it would take, Monash University Research said it would take 495 years to close that gap. 495 years. Hopefully now it's around the 300 years. <laughs> But as we all know, we're not going to be here. Well, some of us might. We'll always be here in spirit, of course. We live on this earth, but we'll be somewhere else. So these are, this is the outstanding um, unfinished business that we have to do, as well as the incarceration rates. Aboriginal women are the fastest growing prison population on the planet. And so are our people. It's not in America. It's here, in our own backyards, but they like to suppress those numbers and say, oh, it's not that bad, really. In terms of uh, child protection, same thing. Our kids are being taken away at an alarming rate. This has to stop too. This has to stop, which brings me on to my, um, uh, to my comments about treaty in... Um, <coughs> in Queensland and in fact the treaty I'm sure will become a national uh, agenda item too <coughs> because they're talking about voice, treaty and truth. So back in 2018 um, I was appointed to co-chair um, the treaty, treaty um, eminent panel. Uh, Quentin Bryce was on there, Kerry O'Brien, uh, there was Michael Lavarch, Nick Gooder, uh, and others. We had a treaty working group of which Charmaine Foley was uh, involved in too, to, uh, uh, to sort of corral the, the white fellas because she's so good at that in terms of uh, um, how, she, how she works through um, her work. And uh, through, throughout COVID, we had COVID of course, up and down. Uh, we had consultations about 2,000 people, 24 locations across Queensland. Uh, that proved pretty fruitful. What they wanted were two basic things to, apart from everything else, um, which were, uh, they said, we can't have a process without truth telling. We have to do the truth telling. And the other one was that we never ceded sovereignty in our country or anywhere. So those were the two main points, the basic points that people wanted us to put forward and, and to get out there. And as we see through our writings, through our books, through our art, our literature, dance, uh, song, ceremony, that, um, that these uh, imperatives in terms of being able to make sure that that truth-telling process still continues, and it will. So we're about, uh, I guess, 
We, we looked at also models that were in uh, British Columbia, which I think is probably the best. We looked at um, Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand, which, you know, uh, depends on who you ask, but at least it's something. It is a bargaining tool. It's, it has a leverage point. We don't have any of that. We're the only Commonwealth country in the world that has never ceded a, a treaty with its peoples. Those calls for treaties are not new. They have been going for decades. And in fact, when uh, the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation handed down our report, uh, it said, well, you know, there was a government bureaucrat sitting in with us, and she said, probably keeping an eye on us. And she said, oh, please don't use treaty. Could you do a compact agreement? Another word except treaty. And we thought, we'll blow you, we're going to use treaty. <laughs> so, you know, when we handed our reporting, um, uh, uh, well, the march over the bridge happened then, 2000. We left treaty in. We said it will become a reality one day, and here we are. Here we are seeing that uh, reality come to a fruition. So we looked at all the overseas models, and we picked out um, issues that would inform us around um, the treaty making they did in their country. But as you know, horses for courses, we're all very different. We need, um, we need a diversity but we also need um, the ways in which we do this. That would be Indigenous-led and Indigenous-controlled. Victoria now has a UREC uh, commission, which is a truth-telling commission, but we're about two years, in fact, behind them. Well, uh, I reckon about three now, if the state government does not act on our report that we put in February, and uh, really uh, there was supposed to be a launch on the 6th of June. That didn't happen. Um, we haven't been officially uh, told when that report will be handed down, but uh, uh, certainly uh, by the Premier, uh, just waiting to get a date for her to, um, uh, to acknowledge that report. But uh, I've been very perplexed, but not surprised, that the actioning hasn't happened sooner. Governments are not really good at implementing recommendations of reports. For example, raw deaths in custody, social justice, and the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation reports, plus others. Others that have sat in the halls of parliament and sat on the dry, dusty shelves of the decision makers and policy makers. We do not, we do not want Queensland Treaty and that report to happen. But what a, what a wonderful opportunity it would have been to have launched this week, you know, 6th of June. I mean, that's been an opportunity lost by this government. And it is a real shame, a real shame. National Reconciliation Week uh, has a theme of be brave, make change. Well, Queensland Government, you have been brave in supporting treaty to date. With your huge investment last, last budget in Queensland, and I truly thank you for this because I think it has been a game changer. Make change and action is now the call that we ask for. And there's no reason, absolutely no reason to delay this. The consultations have been done, the plans delivered on how to progress the next steps and so on. So come on, get real. We have been patient for so, so long, and now we're ready to go. We need the rise 
we need to rise with the momentum now of voice, treaty and truth that the federal government is promising us. Through the Uru Statement from the Heart, which will be acted upon. Here in Queensland, and um, you know, being a parochial Murray myself, and having seen all the work, uh, and I've worked at national level and international level, probably more than I have in the state level, but I'll come back to that. We know that the bureaucrats and governments are very slow to change, but there is, there is no reason why they can't do it now. So I'm calling on all of you um, to write to your politicians and ask them um, what's happening with treaty police in our, in our uh, state here. Because we have the golden opportunity and we've got great people leading this process. People like Mick Gooder, um, Charlene Foley, of course, will be, um, I'm sure she'll have a role in some way. Uh, Josephine Bourne, who's a Torres Strait Islander uh, academic from uh, UQ. Um, Michael Lavarch, Queenslander, ex-Attorney General. Um, he's married and he kind of went up 100% in my estimations when I found out he was married to Larissa Brand from UTS. <laughs> so he's married to one of our gals and she keeps him in tow. <laughs> um, look, we know that the um, No campaign will be will run hard against us. And as I said before, we'll see all the uglies come out. You know who they are and I won't name them because really there are far too many of them to name. And who's the worst of that? I'll leave that up to you. But I do know that I, and I have faith in the Australian public to come back and wholly support us in our um, search for social justice and the very uh, nature of uh, overcoming uh, what we need to do in terms of lifting those horrible, horrible statistics that I spoke about just before. So I'd like to um, probably end, but before I do, Stephen Mann mentioned that uh, yellow coat and my royal blue um, blouse and my yellow and blue shoes uh, that were put into the um, museum in Canberra. And a uh, funny little story, one of my dear friend's uh, grandsons went into there and he's about 11 years old. He came running home to his mother and he said, Mum, I saw Jackie Shrine in the museum. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's nice. I love my shrine. Um, but he, um, it's lovely, you know, it was lovely. I think it still stands there. And they were, uh, that was the uh, stuff I did most of my reconciliation work in, officially, and, you know, even sitting down with John Howard and trying to make sense through that. Uh, it didn't, it didn't. Um, and. You know, I asked him years later, are there any regrets about not saying sorry to, to our people, stolen generation? And uh, he looked at me and I never got an answer, so I knew what that meant. So, um, thank you all for, um, for listening. I'm sure that, uh, you know, the next stage of our next 10 years is gonna be very exciting, very, very exciting. I want to see change for our people in our country and I want to see good people like you come along with us and guide us through that because um, it, will be, it will be a difficult time for us during the referendum stage stages. Personally, I think it will be at the end of um, the uh, Labor government's term, but who knows? We've got a whole lot of community education uh, to get through as well, you know, to educate people uh, about uh, what this means to us in terms of uh, voice, treaty, truth. I understand also that the Queensland Government are setting up uh, a mechanism for voice, um, but they might, might hold off with that now. Um, in terms of treaty, let's put the foot on the pedal with this one. I don't want to be, you know, five years behind Victoria, 
I want to be up with them very soon. And we have the resources now. There is no excuse for us not to be doing our work. So please, in whatever way you can help us, um, make sure this becomes a reality. And it's a reality for all of us, not just our people, our First Nations peoples of this country. So thanks for uh, listening. What, what a molly, and we'll take some questions now, huh, Steve? Yeah. Thank you. I thought I might give a small shout out to um, the Sunshine Coast. This year, the Sunshine Coast has the largest National Reconciliation Week program that we've ever had. And if you're looking for some events that's going to be happening over the next few days, you can find it on Sunshine Coast Council's website under First Nations. Um, I heard a little rumour that uh, the Premier was looking to do an announcement soon and you, it may be on the Sunshine Coast. So it may or may not happen, but if it does, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> While I've got the mic, because I think I have to pass it upwards and across once... Um... We've got another one. Oh, we've got another one? Oh, excellent. Um, so I, I might take the privilege to ask a little question. Um, I was lucky enough to attend the Brisbane Writers Festival and I was um, on your book about Uncle Jack. And my question was, if you could um, perhaps elaborate for some of the people here that may not know about the story. But I was touched by Uncle Jack's experience when he came back as a returned veteran. Mm -hmm. And, you know, despite some of the things that happened, um, you know, his approach and philosophy to life and reconciliation and then even with your own experience and a feminist approach working in government and bureaucracy, both non-First Nations but also in the First Nations community, you know, what perhaps are some of the little surprises or learnings you have from that? Thank you, Steve. That was a that's a nice question, actually. Um, uh, Stephen is referring to my book that I got out uh, 1st of April because we said we had a deadline um, of Anzac Day. I wanted to get this book out before Anzac Day. My sister and I, Nairi Jara, uh, wrote, co-wrote the book. And my father was a, a POW or the Burma Rala. He uh, died at the age of 38. My, uh, we were then four months, two years, three years, and uh, eight years of age. Uh, so uh, there were many questions in our head about why did he go to war? And my grandfather, World War I, when they weren't even citizens of their own country. We've asked ourselves that time and time again. And we kind of, at the end of our research and doing the book, we probably figured out, because he wanted to um, uh, emulate his father, he was an only child. Sadly, he came back from the war an orphan. Both his parents had died. He was an only child and uh, he loved his father, adored his father, so we can only speculate that he wanted to follow in his footsteps and go to... Uh, go to war. Um, as soon as he landed in Singapore, he was sent right up to the railway. Bad luck, you know. Well, no, when you sign up to war, uh, sorry, when you sign up to the Defence Force, you could go anywhere in the world, but, uh, you know, they picked the wrong place for him to go. So he spent all his time on the, uh, the death railway, as they call it. But his resilience and um, he, he was super fit, uh, A-grade footballer, um, the first Indigenous lifesaver in the country, the first Aboriginal man to work at the PMG, which is now the Australian Post. Um, he came back and he married my uh, dear mother from Sherberg. Um, he, he lived a life that was pretty um, you know, exceptional in, in those times because he didn't face the indignities of the people 
that were on the squalor and poverty camps, the Aboriginal camps, that were on the holding pens for our people to be sent to, to the missions. They were on the outskir outskirts of his town of Air North Queensland. So, um, you know, this kind of thing, I think that's where our roots of reconciliation, well, certainly for me, came from, because uh, it was extraordinary uh, in terms of him being a free man, rather than, you know, my mother being imprisoned in Sherberg Aboriginal Mission, rounded up on the back of a cattle truck and sent from Carnarvon Gorge Springshaw area in the 1920s. And uh, they were so different, their lives were so different. But for me, and, and then she came here and then she worked the reconciliation um, roundabout. She, she worked that way before ahead of its time, before you even knew the term reconciliation, in terms of working with white people and making sure our people received, um, you know, a good bed, um, housing and food and clothing when they came off the missions and reserves. Uh, like many of our mothers, our, our women from Sherbrooke here, uh, and our fathers did as well. So for us, I guess we're stooped in that um, uh, the knowledge that we know that this just didn't come from anywhere. It came from our, our lived experience in terms of the work that we do now and doing that um, the work for human rights and uh, social justice. But there is still a long way to go and uh, I know I'm not trying not to get ahead of myself, Steve, in terms of you know, really expecting the best, which I do expect the best, but being disappointed that the real, you know, there's a reality that we may receive a no, a no vote. And what does that say to our people? What does it say to all of you that support and recognise us? I will be devastated, let me tell you. We can't afford to lose this one, so we really do need to round up more people that will, uh, will vote for us uh, come the referendum. But there's a long journey to go on that too. But thank you for that question. Uh, Paul, do you have a question? And anybody else? I should confess, first of all, being one of Jackie's best supporters. <laughs> 53 years. You've been in the struggle with us all. Look, can I just say here? This is Paul Richards. Our mother used to call him um, uh, her solicitor, her lawyer. But he said, I don't think your mother ever used me for nothing. And I said, yeah, no, she didn't. You know, we were goody goodies, but anyway, <laughs> sorry for it. Thank you. Just wanted to suggest, maybe you should ask the government a question. Aren't they ashamed that the firsts have all occurred without any real help or benefit from the government, but in fact in opposition to the government? For example, the first solicitor of the history of Queensland was Jackie Payne in about 87, and she did it herself uh, through articles, and you know, the, se the second one was Tony McAvoy, did through articles and so forth. But Jackie became a magistrate, uh, uh, or some years ago now, uh, but then uh, the first district court judge was three years ago. The first uh, uh, Supreme Court judge was is coming this week or next week or something. It's been announced. It's happening. Um, the, 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 all the firsts have been an individual Aboriginal Island people by their own effort achieving things in the in the opposition and with, with the government being an obstacle in many cases and being discouraged by people that you can't do it because you're Aboriginal or Island. You know. Can you point out to them perhaps that, that, it, 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 that people have achieved these things? They had any help from them. And it's about time they started giving some people some help. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. And as I say, he's been in a struggle with us for 53 years now. And uh, I hope there's a couple of your books out there still for sale. Paul. What is it called again? The Agitator. One of the things I always tried to do is to, when, when the, the, the police or the government have done something wrong, you turn it around to your advantage somehow. 
So for example, in 1986, 100 police, police with battens and dogs attacked a peaceful Aboriginal social function at Rosalie in, in Brisbane. And I happened to get caught up in the ballet and got whacked in the head and thrown in the van too. So I've just published a book, it's called Adventures with Agitators. On the front cover is my watch house photograph. <laughs> and, and I'm very proud of it because the, the copper that whacked me actually helped me. For example, I, I, I was found not guilty of obscene language. I sued them and got compensation, which paid my tax that year. <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting roughed up once a year and have to pay my tax. <laughs> Thirdly, I got the watch house, original watch house photograph from the exhibits and it's hanging on my wall with great pride. Uh, fourthly, or thirdly, or thirdly, anyway, I got the, 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 my status at the Aboriginal community went up nowhere, I was a hero. <laughs> and lastly, I, 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 I got uh, the mute got to use it for the front cover of my book. Now, the copper probably thought, thought it could be a hard time, and the Bajoki Peterson fascist regime probably were only too happy. But in fact, I turned it to my advantage. Now, I tried to do that throughout my, my practice with all with Aboriginal people. So, at, at the agitators comes from a 1980 court case where the, the, uh, the chairman of uh, the Yarraba Aboriginal community, Mr Percy Neal, was trying to Aboriginalise the workforce. And he was therefore proposing that they get rid of the non-skilled white people who were working there and either train the Aboriginal people to work in those positions <coughs> and actually take it out themselves. So the government set him up on a charge of spitting on a white man, took it to court, and, and it, 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 it did, he didn't do it anyway, but of course, a, 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 in those days, the magistrates were not lawyers. They were public servants that worked their way out by being loyal servants to the government. So the magistrate in sentencing him said, uh, any Aboriginal who agitates for change in the Aboriginal community deserves to be more seriously punished as a sentencing principal and sent him to jail for three months. So I thought to myself, when well, I can't write the book, all these people like Jackie and all these Aboriginal people I've worked with were all agitators. And we went to the High Court. Lionel Murphy said uh, that, that uh, Oscar Wilde had once said, our civilization would never have progressed without the benefit of agitators. And therefore, Mr. Neal is entitled to be an agitator. So, and Jackie's one of them. <laughs> Please join us all in being agitators. Make noise. Oh, hi, Jackie. Uh, I'm wonderful to hear you live. I've heard you for probably at least 30 years on the radio over the years. And, yeah, it's been uh, having a day like this or so not come around. Uh, but what I do want to ask is I'm not clear on is there any impediment to implementing the voice to parliament? at the same time as the treaty process, because politicians are masters at setting up false dichotomies, and um, already I've sort of heard a little bit about, uh, oh, you know, we can't do this until we get that, or... Yeah. yeah. No, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Rob, for your question, because it's a very good one, and people do get confused about uh, the sequence, what follows what, and who should do what. I'm saying to you that here in Queensland, we have the opportunity right now to forward the process of treaty or treaties. We have resources, I'm talking $300 million that we were granted in the last uh, Queensland budget. Fantastic, we love it, it's wonderful. We have that opportunity now, we have the team to do it to lock into place. There will be, of course, expressions of interest so we can represent the whole state, okay? We have that opportunity here. Um, federally, there's the voice that's being um, established. Queensland is in the process of doing their voice, but I don't know which way the government will take this. I believe, like Linda Burney does, we can run all these at the same time but while we have the opportunity here in Queensland to do our own bit, we should be doing it. You know, the voice, treaty and, and truth, well, you know, truth fits into all of those things. And we do want, um, I think the feds are talking about a, a Makarata um, commission. We want one in our state because, you know, <laughs> Queensland is very different from other states. 
process. You know that. We all grew up here, most of us did. We know the brutality of our history, and we know, um, you know, there were elements there of, of good work together. There were the unpalatable truths that we need to tell. And by gee, we've got to start doing that now while we're all here and to enjoy the fruits of our labour of getting this stuff through. So I really do believe we can run those three things at, at the same time. But we have this opportunity in Queensland right now, we've got to start it. And uh, Victoria, as I said, miles ahead, they're just going ahead. They've got a good government, they have had for years in terms of probably not in relationship to the COVID experience, but um, you know, certainly in relation to the way they deal with their First Nations peoples. So yeah, run them at the same time, I reckon, and go with what we can. Thanks, Rob, for your question. Uh, so I have a question. My name is Jenny Harvey. Um, back in the day when we were doing reconciliation, we were running actually the Sunshine Coast Reconciliation Group from our Noosa Community Health Centre. And as part of that, uh, we set up with Aunt Carol and other, and Daly and Walbra, um, mm -hmm. some reconciliation study circles in yeah. the Community Health Centre. And we had great little books that helped us go through the process of studying the story here, what reconciliation was, they were fabulous. And that, those circles we created were just great at recruiting people, but telling the truth. So I've been thinking since all of this, like since when the statement came out, are there any tools like that that we, Megaloo, can use with our mom to educate them about this whole story and get them on the side? Yeah, I'm not quite up to date on all that uh, that side of it. Steve might be able to tell you to answer that question. Are there any tools that Mob can use here? Like those, remember those, they were called the study circles, yeah. remember? Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, and there was a board game called the Reconciliation Board yeah. Game too. It's a little bit outdated, but still, it's still there. Um, but I'm not particularly working in that area, as Steve is. Um. Good question. I know there's the, I'm trying to remember the name, the From the Heart website. Yeah. So there's two websites, one is the Uluru Statement and the other is From the Heart. From the Heart, um, that's run by Dan Parkin and uh, Mel Pearson. Uh, has a lot of resources, uh -huh. some campaign material, right. um, some of that educational stuff. Um, and other than that, I think really Reconciliation Australia's website is quite useful. And uh, try to remember <coughs> how the name of the school program, Narragunnawally. Who was that? Narragunnawally. Narragunnawally? Yeah, we've yeah, got two sites here. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's Jingle? From the Heart and the Uluru Statement websites. Go through resources. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Unless um, Linda or Denise want to add to that in terms of resources, yeah? No, no, referring to more updated stuff about, you know, all the statements in the heart, what, that, what does that mean? And you know, voice, treaty, truth. Just, I know South Australia's got some on them. South Australia. South Australia. South Australia. South Australia. It's all a network in the sky, yeah. we'll be able to Yeah, and look, those are the books. <laughs> those are the books there by Megan Davis, uh, Thomas Mayer, um, about, uh, you know, I've seen them in bookshops about understanding the Uluru Statement from the, from the heart, you know, so there, there are all those texts um, in literature. In the literature. Honestly, I think we're the mob that's got to do it. Yes. You know, we're the ones who've got to change our mob. That's what, yeah, yeah. it's up to us now. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. That's so true. Thank you for your work, too, you've been doing all these years.
Oh, sorry. Hi. I, I, I want to mention a, a website that I and a colleague of mine, Wiradjuri artist Glenn Buffery. Glenn is a very fine artist who's in Melbourne. We, we are in the process of producing this website. It's already up for six months of the year. And I'm a historian by training. And it covers day by day the violent dispossession of Indigenous peoples right throughout Australia because as you would know well, every state and territory has a story. So this has a daily entry, picking it up particularly from the work of folk like Henry Reynolds, Jonathan Richards, uh, uh, Noel Lewis, a whole range of historians, Linda Ryan particularly. Any uh, Aboriginal ones in there? We have, sorry? Do you have any Aboriginal historians in there with you? No, uh, uh -huh. these are all, it, it's simply a cut and paste book. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not writing it originally. We've, we've drawn particularly from the Indigenous, from Aboriginal history, the journal, because we wanted to have the historians who've contributed in the last 20 to 30 years doing that. The, the main contributor in terms of being Indigenous is, is Glenn. And he, is, he, he has artwork on every page of our website. Uh, but it's designed also to be a resource through schools throughout Australia, particularly at the senior school level, to put folk in touch with the records that are there of the uh, Australia-wide experience of violent dispossession. Okay, thanks very much for that, and people should have a look at that too. Thank you. It's called, it's called So That We Remember. So that we remember, lest we forget. <laughs> yes. Hello. Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. My name is Gretchen. And um, just speaking about your campaign, two things that I, I don't know, I'd love your opinion on, because I went and did my Masters of Fine Art in Spain. And to my surprise, one of the first subjects we did was the history of colonisation from the cockroaches. You know, sitting there and they were talking about all these things about what they did in the past, I'm like, oh, excuse me, we still do those things in Australia, and they were horrified. I'm like, oh no, by these definitions, our government is still very active in colonisation, that whole concept. And I was thinking, like um, Mr Richardson was saying, maybe turning around with the campaigns, this whole creation of other, which was used very, very successfully in things like the Trump campaign creation of fear and creation of other is what is the most successful tactic in colonisation used since the beginning of the whole charade, you know, in every every kind of conquering nation's behaviour. So using that back and twisting around and eliminating this whole concept of the other and getting rid of all of this fear. And the other interesting paper that I thought was quite mind blowing was the um, the danger of the power of positivity. It's this really great paper. Have you you would have heard? No. Uh, it was it was talking about um, it's an older paper but we used it in the context of looking at the Obama campaign. So people were almost and the way we see it manifested now with social media and everything, everyone has to be active, everyone has to be positive. Anything negative and a cause is really frowned upon. But it's what was used very, very successfully in Obama's campaign is this the power of yes. So if you were saying no, you were really frowned upon. And this whole concept of using positive power. Anyway, I thought that were kind of could be useful, interesting, kind of different perspectives. But it was so funny that these people were sitting on the other side of the world thinking that colonisation was a thing of the past. I'm like, oh, oh no. It's alive and well in this country, believe me, alive and well. Thank you for the comment. Thank you very much, Jackie. I uh, really thought the talk was most appropriate. And um, I'd like to add to the gentleman who gave the various historians. Well, just recently, I became aware of an Indigenous historian and his 
right here in Queensland, South East Queensland. His name is Dr. Ray Kirko. <laughs> Is he indigenous? No, he's Dutch. He identifies as indigenous. No, he doesn't. Does he? I'd be very surprised if he did, because uh, there were about 10 indigenous historians in this country, and I was the first. So, and he is not one of them. And he's never claimed to be one of them. Well, he's written a very interesting book, and it's called The Battle one tree you know, there's, there's not a law against that. Sorry? Yeah, it's quite appropriate that someone likes that battle, irrespective yeah. of their ethnicity. Yeah. Okay, finish. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you're just plugging his book, were you? We oh, just... no, no, it's... Um, no, well, no, was there a question, or was there a follow-up question from that? Oh, I just... I, I thought that, well... He's not indigenous. He's not. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. There's an a question. Yeah. Can you explain why would you why would you want the Queensland government to do a treaty in Queensland as well as the national one? Oh well, I'll tell you why. Um, this was hand flicked to the states and territories when the feds did not want to take treaties on. Ken White said. We will leave this up to the states and territories. So they flicked the ball to us. They're probably regretting it now, but they did. So yes, we look forward to a national treaty. Well, I do. But first we do it in our own backyards and we make it real here because we are so down the track in our state. You know, we just need this to be resuscitated and brought forward. And we are different from states. We have different states. I mean, Queensland, very closely followed by West Australia, have had the worst treatment of our people. The worst, and I would argue that, in terms of the colonisation of our country, our treatment and the laws. Now, I said this last week, you know the laws of uh, Queensland, the Aborigines Protection and Sale of Opium Act, 1897, um, the laws from there, South Africa modelled their apartheid regime on the Queensland legislation and those laws, out of sight, out of mind. People at Sydney's Writers' Festival, Festival were aghast at that. They didn't know. This is our history. So, you know, there's a lot of history to be caught up with and a lot of history to, um, to know about. We'll just take two quick uh, questions. Paul, you wanted to say something else. Perhaps we can take yours and then I'll go to the lady at the front here before uh, Jackie can answer. Paul, you had a go? Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 quick question, please. <laughs> Thank you. I was just thinking, in terms of what the lady up there said, it, it, it made me remember an idea I've been floating with you and others, and that is that some way to recognise the allies you have in some sort of formal way. So, for example, uh, it, it, I think it would involve perhaps an application to a native title uh, prescribed body corporate for sort of like an honorary membership. You get no rights to, to land, no rights to vote or anything like that, but you have a right to be notified of what's going on in their community and invited to the things that go on. And then you count up the numbers of your honorary members or whatever you want to call them. And when you go to the government, you can say we've got tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people who are behind us and are part of our movement and that provides a great deal more pressure on the government than simply people sitting down around the table and saying, this is what we think you should do because it's the right thing. Friends of Reconciliation, yeah. right? There was a movement years and years ago, Bev will remember that. We really should, you know, reignite that one, please, because reconciliation has warmed us up to where we are. I so believe in that. And there are a lot of supporters out there I think that should bring that stuff back on again, and I think we're going to have some discussions with uh, Reconciliation Australia in, in um, Sydney about that too. Yeah, but good point, really good point. It needs to happen. 
Hi, no. Dr. Jackie, um, Rebecca here. I wanted to know what your thoughts were on the Australian curriculum and how new teachers can um, embed more tradition and culture from First Nations people. Mm. Because I know that there is parts, because I'm new to your study, yeah. um, but I've also had children go through primary school and even though it's in the curriculum, um, it's, it's not done much. Oh, yeah, okay. I'll just tell you my little personal story. My sister, Nairi Jaro, who co authored um, Jack of Hearts QX 11594 with me, our father's book, teaches at Milton State School. Those kids get stolen generation, constitution, uh, you know, soldiers at war, you name every aspect of Aboriginal society. She will teach it and she will make sure that that's taught. There are no Aboriginal kids, as we know, at Milton State School, very white, middle-class, privileged school, as you know. They are going to be our future professionals when they come out of here. How amazing is that? But these kids are learning that, and she's known as the love bomb of Milton State School, because she teaches that. But that's the luxury of having Aboriginal um, teachers. But in terms of the curriculum, yes, I think it could be better. If there are any other, you know, teachers in the house, you know, let us know. But uh, probably have a yarn to us out there because we're running out of time. Thanks. And Steve, we've got Honey Hope up the back there. And was there someone here who had their hands up for like ages? Yes. Yeah, and then <laughs> we'll let Honey Hope and then we'll come back to you, hey? I can't follow on Hope. No. <laughs> you could give the mic to her, sis. <laughs> Go on, what do you want? She don't want to follow you. Go on. Go ahead. I Robert. just want to uh, thank you, uh, first of all, and on behalf of us all, for your contribution, not only to the same, but for all, everything that you've done in now. Uh, Pursuing the um, pursuing, I suppose, all of those issues that are very, very important to us, and it, it's really great to have uh, a representative such as yourself, Dr. Evans. I also wanted to uh, just reflect on one meeting that I was at at the Brisbane City Council. And it was a, a fairly well packed <coughs> pack meeting at the City Hall when um, the rights, uh, the peace, uh, the peace movement that was established way back then by Pat Dobson and which later then progressed on to reconciliation. Um, that um, one of the issues that did come up at that um, meeting was in fact the, um, the title of reconciliation. When do you stop reconciling and start considering conciliation and I guess that's that's one thing that I personally would like to see I mean we've had so much time over these years uh, since reconciliation was established under the first chairperson of uh, Dr. Lou Scott yourself <coughs> And now with the um, um, the latest chairperson in Kay Mundine's daughter. Mm. When do we stop having to, in fact, educate people? When do we start looking at furthering the compacts and treaties? Because that's when I see compacts and treaties 
still considering reconciliation, but rather focusing on conciliation with the compacts and the agreements and the treaties. For goodness sake, there's treaties in just about every aspect of our global life. You have treaties right across the board in, within states and territories and our federal government. That's where I guess the battens are passed back to state and territory governments to pursue treaties because under the federal legislation there can only be a general provision for the concept of treaty to be progressed. However, it's still going to be up to states and territories to make sure that it happens at the local and state um, levels. And you're right, yeah. Dr. Evans, you're absolutely right. There is the infrastructure to be able to do that, that already exists. Thank you, Sister Hope, and um, I want to thank you too for all your work you've done around reconciliation. With me, way back in the old days, is, uh, as we call it, so yeah, and it is, it it's very much is about a conciliation, you know, um, unity ticket that we're all now, yeah. Okay, is this the last question and then I want to say something? Uh, yeah? Come on, don't be shy. Come on, you know you want to do it. <laughs> Please. Um, thank you, Dr. Jackie Huggins. Uh, what the question I have for you was: we've had a couple of comments in the audience about different sources of knowledge, and what I hope to draw on was, from your perspective, the importance of making sure when we're looking for knowledge and seeking to inform our responses, that we take the time to make sure that we're looking to Aboriginal voices and Aboriginal knowledges. With the rich experience you've got over all of your years in academia and in politics, in activism, advocacy and sharing, why is that important for us to do? Important, you know, I've said this, I've kind of broken the record on all this stuff, like uh, Sister Hope, Denise and others, is about please, Go educate yourselves, you know. There is no excuse, as there was 30 years ago, when you couldn't find any books, you couldn't find any docos, films, anything in the arts. Just make sure, you know, if you feel educated about it, then educate your families. Educate, you know, the people who are closest to you, your, your loved ones, you know, to find out um, uh, what is behind the history of our country. So I think that, um, I hope that's answered your question, but I'm, probably I'm, not. I'm more asking too, because we've, we've seen recognition of Neolith historians, for mm. example. Mm. Why, why is it that, that um, rich Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sources bring that we cannot obtain? Why is it important? What is that extra? Yeah, well look, I, I think um, the history that we have as Aboriginal historians is a deeper history and certainly, I believe the oral history trumps the written record, you know, trumps it. For instance, and very quickly, my mother had told us that our grandfather was wounded twice in World War II, and then his whole battalion got wiped out while he was in hospital. Now, I used to think, oh, fanciful, yeah, sure. When I went to write Jack of Hearts, there it was in the military records, there it was, wounded in the shoulder and then wounded in the calf on different occasions. We never did find out whether his, um, whether his uh, battalion got wiped out, um, so I weren't too sure about that, but he came home to the war, of course, and father my father. But look, I think you should really, there are, there are about a dozen of us now, historians, John Maynard, um, uh, even Gary Foley writes, uh, writes 
history of non-fiction, a guy called Tony Birch, um, who's winning all these major literary prizes. You know, I reckon that's the real source, you know? Uh, white historians can, and to their credit, I studied under the finest historians, which were Dr. Raymond Evans at the University of Queensland, and who are the both professors now, and Professor Kay Saunders. They taught me all I know, a lot of what I know about history, and I give them absolute credit. But when I started reading and writing our histories, that it kind of, the, uh, the complexion changed in that way, you know? So I do, uh, uh, you know, uh, ask you all to um, read the stories by Blackfellas that were so um, hidden that we were never able to publish these things to the extent that we're able to do that now. And that goes across all poets and uh, uh, short storytellers and fiction writers. It's, there's an explosion out there. And I think people should uh, avail themselves of that opportunity. Now, do I get a go? Yes. Or do you want to? I just got yes. just two minutes to indulge myself. Um, I just wanted to add very quickly oh. if I can. <laughs> that, and uh, just to recognise Arnie Hope again. Arnie Hope, Dr. Hope Ho Chin, just delivered two talks yesterday oh. on voice, treaty, truth, and justice, and it was really amazing based on her PhD. Um, we also had Uncle Belza launch our National Reconciliation Week up here, Bill Lower, um, with a particular Torres Strait perspective being 30 years since the Mabo decision this 3rd of June. I think hearing First Nations voices is so important, particularly when First Nations people have been so dispossessed. They've had everything taken from them, They've been suppressed, denied, you know, forced into slavery effectively, had their children ripped out. That to give them back that voice is just a small way everybody can make a contribution. And it's so vital to the healing process, the process of witnessing that a person First Nations person can share their story, their truth, and everyone will have their truth, and it'll be different to somebody else's truth. But for that person to be able to have an audience, to have a friend, to have an ally to share that with, to be, to have that story, that truth acknowledged, it's all part of that healing process. So it's not just about historians telling the truth or the history. It's not just about First Nations people standing up in front and sharing their truth. It's also about listening and hearing those stories. Thank you. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the final long call. People have been asking me where I got my tr deadly tra trousers from. <laughs> They are from support Indigenous artists, please. These trousers, are, they're in orange and other colours. Um, all shapes and sizes from Mark uh, Meyer. Uh, the artist's name is Elverina Johnson. She comes from Yarraba Mission, uh, south of Cairns. It's amazing that she has her products in such a mainstream, you know, uh, department store. So this girl's going to be rich, I think. <laughs> but good on her, good on her. She struggles, she's from Struggle Street. Um, she is a, a survivor of domestic violence. Great community worker in her community, does everything. So please, if you feel like that, uh, I don't know if that in men's, um, men's <laughs> way, but anyway. That's all right. Admirers in Brisbane. In, uh, in now, I just want to tell you about this quickly before I go. Uh, this is a scarf that was made for me by a um, Aboriginal woman artist in um, Strabag Island, Marcia Boring. Oh, yeah, thanks. And um, she knew I was going to the UN in my days of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples, of which I co-chaired, but was 
defunded, of course, by the feds, um, because we dared to criticise them every time we went to the UN <laughs> and other places. So we got defunded. Okay. Now they're trying to put up this voice thing, which is really a replica of the National Congress of Australian People, Australia's First Peoples. We were elected by a people, Indigenous, controlled and led, but they dismantled us like ATSIC. So, okay, so she made me this beautiful scarf. You'll see this emu here, right? The emu's got, the emu's got tracks, he's walking up. Now that yellow, sorry, that uh, blue dot is the world. It's the map of the world. And uh, these two boomerangs, north and south, are for me to come home safely. Back home to my people, back home to um, my people in Australia, but more particularly, um, the emu is the totem for my people from Carnarvon Gorge, Springshaw area, of which my mother was rounded up and sent to Sherbrooke. So isn't that very beautiful? Mm. And I'm wearing it because it's a teal colour. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> Can we please all thank Jackie once more. <laughs> just two things I wanted to mention. Three. I just thought of another one. Um, Jackie's going to be signing her books at the front and we've got some artwork and some other things for sale too if you want to have a look there. Um, I forgot to mention, Lyndon Davis has an art exhibition that just opened yesterday in the University's Art Gallery, which is just over there. Uh, it's open Monday to Saturday, I believe. Not open now, but yeah, pop in and have a look at Lyndon's work. Um, and I've just been told that Linda Burney is on Q&A this week oh, okay. on ABC TV, so that will be interesting to see. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, for sharing. That was fabulous. Did you want to say? Okay. <laughs>